Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Jonathan Farrow, along with Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Join us each day for insight from the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. From our global headquarters in New York City, we are live on Bloomberg Television weekday mornings from 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business app. We begin with our top story, the S&P 500 snapping an eight-day winning streak as traders await payrolls revisions and Fed minutes. Seema Shah of Principal Asset Management seeing stocks grinding higher, writing this. This backdrop is still constructive for risk and a $6 trillion mountain of cash is ready to fuel risk assets. Seema joins us now for more. So Seema, let's go to the punchline. A $6 trillion mountain of cash. What is that mountain of cash and why do you think it's going to be unlocked anytime soon? Hey, John. Well, look, I think there's a couple of reasons. We've seen for the last couple of years investors become cautious. We know the reasons why there's been COVID, there's a regional banking crisis. But also, potentially most importantly, is that people have been able to actually make some kind of really um, interest on those savings. We are on the verge of Fed cuts, um, likely to move at a slightly faster pace, certainly, than what people were anticipating just a few months ago. So sitting in cash is no longer going to be attractive. And I do think investors, of course, you need to take into account the entire backdrop. What are we expecting for risk assets? But we do still think there's opportunities and there's a lot of reinvestment risk. Seema, this is the important question. What is the backdrop? Because you can have a situation where people pile into cash even more, even as rates come down, because they're looking to de-risk away from risk assets. What makes you think they're going to go in the other direction as rate cuts start to come in? What is it about the growth backdrop that tells you things are going to remain pretty strong? Yeah, and I would say that I think in the last couple of weeks, there, of course, there's been a lot of revisions. And I think it's fair to say there's there's increasing uncertainty at the moment. We're still in that soft landing camp. Uh, Like everyone else, we spent the last two weeks pouring over all the data, the macro data, the consumer, the labor, balance sheets, etc. And we're not really seeing any clear signs of weakness. We know that there's an economic slowdown. That should be of no surprise to anyone. It's been underway, I think, since the beginning of Q2 of this year. But a slowdown doesn't necessarily need to transition to recession. We think that the Fed has got a lot of room to cut rates. Um, So actually, for us, the risk of recession is fairly low. And against that backdrop, equities can still perform fairly well. We're not looking at bumper gains like you saw in um, 2023 or certainly in Q1 of this year. But that's still some positive gains to be made. Seema, I love that you go here because Tracy McBillian yesterday was saying uh, of Wells Fargo that she sees the $6 trillion in money market assets heading into equities, maybe a bit more than longer term bonds. Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan Asset Management saying it will flood into all sorts of core bond funds, leading 10 year Treasury yields uh, at 3 percent or potentially lower. Do you agree with that type of assessment? So I think there's a lot of opportunities um, across the equity set. You know, you just have to look outside the U.S. as well. And I think there's a lot of opportunities on the bond side. um, You know, I don't know if we're going to see 10 years quite that low. I think there's so many other factors at play at the moment, particularly in election year, that at least for the time being, that downward pressure is probably somewhat limited. Um, But certainly I do think there's a lot to go into those core bond, bond funds. There are question marks around high yield, around an economic slowdown, which is why there's still so much interest in that investment grade market. Um, So actually, we think there's an opportunity set across not just equities and not just fixed income, but even across real assets. And I so that's the reason why, you know, yes, the economic backdrop is a little bit more uncertain than it was two or three weeks ago, but it's still really important that investors do start to think that, look, when Fed cuts start, cash is no longer attractive and actually staying in cash is probably going to be your biggest risk. Going back to where we started, John talking about a good kind of rate cut and a bad kind of rate cut in terms of what the backdrop is in terms of a good economy or a bad economy. Today, we do get those payrolls revisions, the initial uh, payrolls revisions in the year ended in March. Expectation is fuzzy. It's all over the place. But if we see a revision of, say, a million fewer jobs as reported initially in that period of time, does that change your view? It doesn't change the view, but of course, it's going to add to the impression that the Fed is behind the curve and the Fed is going to have to accelerate its movement, movement somewhat more. It's really tough, though. You know, you were just saying that there's a lot of difficulty, a lot of risk in focusing on one, just one data point. We know that payrolls are all over the place. Um, Even if you think back just to April of this year, where you had a revision down to, I think it was a 116 mark, and then the next month it was back up to above 200. So it's really important that you look across a broad set of data 
uh, across the consumer space, also really focusing on what is the balance sheet strength of households and companies. And I think that's probably going to be um, very important for building up that, that overall picture of the underlying strength of the economy. Personally, I think it will impact Fed pricing. Seema, let's turn to gold. Some big moves so far this year. Gold up by something like 20%, around about that. The move this morning, we're down about a quarter of 1%, pulling back from all-time highs. UBS came out with a note recently, and they're looking for a move to 2700 by the middle of 2025, the middle of next year. And they give a long list of reasons for this move. The Fed shift, central bank buying, portfolio hedges. What do you think the strongest tailwinds behind this move actually are? So look, I think the gold the gold movement has been it's probably been one of the more interesting areas we've had. We've actually maintained a long term exposure to that gold um, in expectation that, as you said, a number of the factors all at play. You've got the Fed cuts, you've got the central bank buying, you've got a lot of bit the risky the risky environment at the moment as well playing in. Um, for us at the moment, I think the concerns around the slowdown they're probably not going to go away. They're not going to be cleared up in the near term. Um, so I think that upward movement for gold are probably here to stay a little bit longer. What do you think it should substitute in a portfolio at the moment? Are you thinking about that, where it fits in? What are you telling people? The gold? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I look, I think, I think having that exposure to real assets is really important. Something around the inflation mitigation, to me, that is where gold also fits in. So I think it ticks a lot of different boxes. Um, somewhere along, you know, having some kind of downward uh, protection but also focusing on what happens if inflation does turn out to be sticky. I know we talk a lot about recession risk, but to ask one of the key concerns that we're thinking about over the next two years or so is what if actually inflation does start to take off again once you've got a number of Fed cuts, and then that becomes more of a worry. So I think having that real asset exposure, commodities, um, anything which is a bit of inflation mitigation still deserves to be a core part of any portfolio. Just to put a line under that, Seema, are you saying on the margins, real assets should replace long duration bonds? I don't think that they should replace. I think that there is an area which they are taking the box for. Long duration bonds are important. If you know you want to have that down, that downward, um, or should I should say that protection against downward economic risk. Gold is a slightly different element, but I do think that across equities, across the fixed income, and the alternative space, there does need to be exposure across all three because you are ticking all your boxes in terms of the risk environment in front of us. Interesting. Seema Shah, Principal Asset Management. Seema, thank you. Thorsten Stark of Apollo shaking off the weakness and focusing on the strength. Daily and weekly data shows that retail sales are strong, jobless claims are falling, restaurant bookings are strong, and air travel is strong. The bottom line is that there are no signs of a recession in the incoming data. Thorsten joins us now for more. Thorsten, good morning to you, sir. Morning, morning. Let's start with these revisions that come in a few hours' time, and I'll share the estimates that come from Goldman, and the range is this wide. OK, it's anywhere from something like 300,000, 600,000, or a million. Anywhere from fifty to eighty-five thousand per month. What do you make of these numbers? JP Morgan three hundred and something, Goldman six hundred to a to a million revised a little bit later this morning. I think this is important for the economist and this is important also for the Fed, but it really is not important for markets. This is looking back in history and trying to figure out how much did employment grow? And if employment grew a little bit less, then yes, of course, overall, that does send a little bit different signal about where we are in the business cycle. But broadly speaking, I don't think this will get much weight in financial markets. What do you think is normal? What's the normal run right now for jobs growth? Is it the 114 of the previous month? Well, so there was a very important paper by uh, Tara Watson and Wendy Edelberg from Brookings or the uh, uh, the, the institute that produced some estimates that says that we will probably have employment growth for the near term at around 200,000, a little bit below. So if that's the case, because of immigration playing such a big role, we should also see a boost to non-farm payrolls. But that's probably going to, over time, fade. So we'll probably get down to the long-run estimate, which we would estimate to be around 100,000. It begs the question why we took last month so seriously, if you don't think we should take the revisions that seriously. Well, but that's also why jobless claims for the last few weeks have been signaling that everything is just fine. If you also look at a broad range of other indicators as we just ran through, both with travel, with uh, restaurant bookings, uh, hotel bookings, also look broadly speaking at how many companies go into default, there's weekly data also for that. We also have a general picture that the economy is just not slowing down. This whole narrative, as you just spoke about with Target, Walmart, TJ Maxx, this whole narrative that we are slowing down is just not evident in the data. So that's why I think that we should in markets think about the outlook for the Fed with that backdrop.
You've said in the past, uh, over the past few months, that you didn't think that any rate cuts were necessary. This comes at a time, at least not this year, this comes at a time we've got 100 basis points of rate cuts being baked into the market. You're saying that it's likely, most likely, that the Fed is going to go next month. What do you think the consequence will be of a Fed that starts cutting next month at a time when you still sounds like don't think it's necessary. Well, that's why, as Neil Dutta was just saying, there is this whole concept that we are way, way too restrictive. But that is only if you have our star or where the Fed is going at a much lower level, maybe I say two and a half or 2.8, as the long run dot says. Then it's true that we are restrictive. Then you need to see the Fed cutting rates quickly. But what if our star, what if, if where we're going is more close to four, four and a half? then we're not in a hurry. So the main test of the answer to your question is, what is the incoming data telling us? The Fed last hiked rates in July of 2023, and still now, 12, 13 months later, we're still waiting for the data to slow down, and it's not happening in any meaningful way. So if Godot didn't arrive here over the last really 18, 24 months, Why should Godot arrive in August of 2024? Some people say Godot is leaving his sort of remnants in different places and giving us a sense (laughs) that maybe he's more present than we previously thought. And we're pointing to potentially some of the retail sales or some of the the negative uh, readings into the non-farm payrolls that we got a couple weeks ago. At what point do you say we still do not need rate cuts, that you have conviction based on all the strength you were just talking about, that Godot is not around, Godot is not coming, and that actually this is a very different environmental uh, environment for the economy. Well, I think we see that reflected in speeches by different FOMC members. Some FOMC members, including Nicky Bowman, have been saying, well, hold on, I need more evidence that we should cut interest rates. Others are more convinced. So getting the committee together for Jay Powell and making sure that the committee is moving gradually in the direction of interest rates moving lower, that does take some time. So I think they have agreed now that they will cut interest rates 25 basis points in September. But after that, I think everything is open because the data, it's not slowing down. And again, the retailers reporting earnings and directly the Walmart CEO said, we're not seeing broad base slowdown for the consumer. We need to take that seriously when that's 70% of GDP. So yes, I do understand that in markets, we quote unquote want the economy to slow down. And we're so hooked on the narrative from the Fed that interest rates need to normalize. But we have plenty of time for normalizing interest rates. So that's why let's get that rate cut here on the September the 18th. And that's what Jay Powell will say here at Jackson Hole. But after that, I still think that they are open to, well, let's wait and see exactly how the data plays out. It's also, it just seems to me and to most people that the focus has shifted to the other side of the dual mandate. There's a focus now on the labor market. And even if you're confident, constructive about the future for risk mitigation, risk management purposes, you want to reduce interest rates a little bit from here. Maybe you go 25 and you go 25 again. But it's the other side of the mandate that has been completely neglected over the last two months, I would say. Inflation. You mentioned Governor Bowman. Governor Bowman talked about upside risk to inflation, reiterating her concerns, went through a long list of things, increasing geopolitical tensions, additional fiscal stimulus and increased demand for housing due to immigration. Do you think we should be a little bit more focused on the thing we've been ignoring for the last couple of months? So let's be, of course, clear that inflation did peak at 9.1. Now we're at 2.9. So we are a lot closer to the 2% target. But last time we looked, 2.9 is not 2. So that's why I think she's highlighting. And several other FOMC members are bringing up the same points and saying, well, let's wait a little bit and just make 100% sure that we're still moving down towards 2%. Because the risk is, of course, that if inflation does start to move either sideways or, in the worst case, move higher, then they will need to go back and revise their strong. Just like they did in the beginning of the year, they said we have three cuts. Now it was just one cut. So now the market is really getting ahead of itself. Remember also during the VIX episode and the carry trade on wine from Japan, the market was pricing that Monday that the Fed will cut six times. So that's why the roller coaster ride here in terms of what the market is pricing, it's important to anchor your expectations around what's the incoming data actually showing. So when we talked to you a couple of months ago, you were saying that you could see the strength in the uh, market certainly continuing through the end of the year on the heels of data that continue to be more resilient, stronger than people expect. But that next year, it could be a problem, that you could see that fall off a cliff. Have you changed your view as you see a greater likelihood of a Fed rate cut and the potential for maybe uh, some of the pressure to be eased before next year? Yeah, because I do think that the main reason why the economy is holding up so well at the moment is that there's a significant tailwind from, broadly speaking, a higher stock market 
tighter credit spreads and easy financial conditions across the board supporting the economy in a very broad way. And because of that, that does mean that now we have had some correction in the Magnificent Seven. Now the stock markets are beginning to show some signs of wobbling a little bit more. They have rallied, of course, here after the carry trade on wine. But if there is any reversal in the strong tailwind from the stock market, then it would begin to have some implications, in particular for middle income and high income consumers, both those who own the S&P 500 and own their home, but also those who own credit, private credit included, where the cash flows have been basically the best levels in decades. Anyone who owns fixed income are seeing cash flows on the consumer side that are very, very strong, and that continues to be a very important tailwind to the economic outlook. Torsten, it's been far too long. Let's do this again soon. It's good to see you. Torsten Slock there of Apollo. Here's the view from Anders Persson over at Nuveen. He writes the following. We expect the Fed to cut by 25 basis points at each meeting through mid-25. Larger cuts, including a 50 basis point move in September, are possible if incoming labour market data continues to deteriorate at the same pace as the July jobs report. Anders joins us now for more. Anders, good morning to you. Good morning. We Thanks talked a lot me. about the jobs revisions we get a little bit later this morning. Torsten Slot came on the programme from Apollo and basically caused pour threes in cold water all over the conversation Lisa from I've been having all morning and said it won't matter to markets. <laughs> Do you think this is going to matter to markets at 10 a.m.? I'm actually more in Torsten's camp that I don't, I don't think it's going to matter a whole lot. Why is that? I think it's, it's, uh, it's a backward looking number, of course. It's uh, year to day through March, so it's you know, start slightly outdated at this point. Uh, I think it's, it's a number economists will definitely digest and kind of take a harder look at. But from a market perspective, I think we're really more focused on what's happening here going forward. And obviously the most recent data was more interesting and we're, we're more focused on what's coming here going forward. So I would say historically this has not been a number that's been all that market driven and don't anticipate it to be today. Either. Don't you think where we've been informs where we're going? And the reason I ask that question, if Goldman's right and we get a revision low of anywhere between 50 to 85,000 jobs per month, wouldn't we have traded on that data a little bit differently over the last 12 months? Yeah, I mean, I think today and this year, given the job markets, it's very much front and center in terms of focus. And I think the market has shifted from an inflation focus to more of a job markets focus right now. So I do think this year, this time around, it's more of a more interesting data point. But at the same time, I think the, the numbers, if you look from like 300,000 to a million, the, 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 the estimates are very, very wide. So economists can't even kind of agree on what the numbers should be here. So, yeah, it's a data point. I think we have to digest it. But, you know, quite frankly, I think the market's going to be looking more forward and, and to certainly the NFP number coming in, in September. Part of the problem is that we've talked about the importance of data dependency, and then person after person comes on and says, but does the data actually matter? And we're left scratching our heads with our whipside necks and looking at all the data between Macy's and TJ Maxx and, TJ Maxx and wondering what matters to anyone. You're talking about the idea of 10-year yields being in fair value around 4%. Bob Michael is talking about 3%. And you both don't see the economy falling off a cliff. So why are you not in the 3% camp? Right. Well, I think Bob is referring to 3% some time out, right? Like I think you mentioned 12 to 18 months out. I think that that's much more realistic. Right now, we're talking fair value around 4% as, as we're sitting here today. From, from our perspective, we think the 10 years has run a little bit too quickly here. It is sort of a slower kind of top month. I think there's some uh, investors out there probably using that as a, a cheap option versus equity, so to say. So if we have a harder landing, they can use that part of the market uh, to kind of hedge their, that bet a bit. So we are expecting the 10 year to start moving lower in, the, in 2025. We're not expecting as low as that, but you know, three and a quarter is possible by year in 2025. But that's a long time out and the volatility has been quite severe, so to say. So today as we're sitting here, it feels like we've gone a little bit too far too quickly. So that's that 4% that we think is a little more closer to fair value. That said, if you truly believe that the Fed was entering into a rate cutting cycle, and if you truly believe that the neutral rate wasn't that different than it has been historically, that really we just saw distortions from the pandemic, why wouldn't you hoover up as much 10-year bonds as you possibly could right now ahead of 2025. Why wait? Why be cute about it? Well, I mean, I think the trend is, is lower for sure. So, so that, that is, you know, the backdrop that we've been saying for some time, the rates should start moving lower. I think the two year is going to be a lot more quicker to move and we're expecting the two year to start moving lower. And, and, you know, we're expecting a flat yield curve by, by year end. 
we're actually seeing also an upward sloping yield curve going into next year. So, you know, probably more comfort around the two year moving lower, and that's going to be more correlated to Fed cuts as we move into to next year. The 10 year again, yeah, I think the backdrop will be lower for, for next year, but uh, there are a lot of moving pieces here. So we've seen a lot of volatility. We have actually found more opportunity in the spread markets in general, and I felt more comfortable putting bets on that side, less so on the treasury market at this point. Where are you on credit spreads right now? Because they've certainly tightened and come in over the last week. What are you waiting for? Yeah, credit spreads we think are you know, probably fair value to bit rich now. We have been waiting for spreads to start widening out as the economy starts slowing. Uh, it had a very quick move, you know, two weeks ago or so. About 100 a basis bit, points. Exactly. So, so very quick move and came back very quickly. At this point, we're, you know, we're expecting that to start widening out a little bit. So high yield around 320. We could see that going out to maybe 350 again as, you know, economy starts slowing down and we're more focused on that. So, Can you walk us through your process just a little bit? Because I hear this a lot in stocks. We both hear this when it comes to stock markets. People come on the program and say they want to buy the dip. Then the dip happens and they keep running away because things get scary. You start to wonder where the next 5% is coming from and you start to worry that it's lower. Yeah. Same thing happens with credit spreads. You get 100 basis points of widening, people start to freak out, there's another 100 basis point around the corner. How do you know when to buy? What's the process for you and the team? Yeah, no, I mean, we debate that all the time and I, I will say the, the credit widening we saw a couple of weeks ago was really quite tricky given that you had the job state on Friday, you had the, the carrot trade unwind and some of the geopolitical uncertainties going on all at the same time. So dissecting exactly what was driving what and how much was technical versus fundamental was quite tricky from that perspective. I think if it was jobs data driven only, we would have had more comfort stepping in and saying, listen, this looks cheap and this is a, uh, an interesting opportunity. We did step in for you know, basically buying credit and bonds that we particularly, particularly like, take advantage of that way. But you know, generally, I, I think it's, it's an assessment that gets you know, quite convoluted, and you have to basically take it in totality. Um, so from that perspective, a lot of times we've seen in the past, if you have a big, big move like we did two weeks ago, it can be more coming behind it. And that, that is the tricky part at this point. So we're trying to be dollar cost average, so to say, a bit here, with the assumption that we're going to see spreads moving a bit higher uh, in the rest of the year. Just real quick, the $6.2 trillion in money markets, which asset do you think will benefit the most if people start to move it out? Clearly, I'm a bit biased here, but I do think uh, fixed income is going to be the natural next step here. You Where? know, taxable uh, fixed income and munis overall. Uh, I do think it's a pretty big step, step for somebody who is concerned about, you know, what their uh, views are on economy and the markets to jump all the way into equities or all the way into real estate or even private credit. So it does feel like the natural next step would be munis and fixed income. And, and we're starting to see and hear that more and more. And, and quite frankly, I think a Fed cut would probably be a, a nice psychological kind of step towards that, where it's reinforcing to investors that it's time to make a shift here, and that's what we're anticipating. At least you're honest about where the bias comes from. Anders, thank you, sir. It's thank good you. to see you. Anders Person there of Nuveen. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in markets, economics, and geopolitics. You can watch the show live on Bloomberg TV weekday mornings from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business App. 